All right, I'm back in plenary session, video edition. Uh, I'm joined by Joanna Christia. Joanna is a uh, assistant professor of clinical psychology at the University of Pavia, Italy. Um, and she is based in Italy, although she is originally from Romania. She is a meta researcher extraordinaire. She's a clinical psychologist, and she is somebody that you should be following if you're not following on Twitter. And your handle is, oh, it's at your first name, your middle initial A underscore your last name, Christia. Uh, Joanna, yes. it's a pleasure to get to speak with you. Yes. <laughs> good, good, good. I'm glad. I'm glad you're here. I, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure for me. So sorry, I'm not used to the. Yeah, it's a pleasure to speak to you. Uh, thank you. That's okay. No, um, we have we we chat a fair bit. I don't know if people will know, yes. but mostly by the chat function by typing. Um, and and full disclosure, uh, where you are, it's the it's the afternoon evening, and so you're enjoying a nice glass of wine. So if listeners yes, see you take a sip of wine, full disclosure. And you know that's how I like my I like these interviews because. I, you know, if if when if we did it in person, I would I would serve and I would offer a, a nice beverage to my guest. I think a few glasses of wine and we'll have a real good interview. <laughs> we'll really get to where we want to be. Um, I wanted to start by asking you a question about something you said online. You said, okay. You said, um, I think you were in an argument with somebody, and you said, um, I, uh, I, um. What exactly are your scientific contributions? You asked this person, and then you said, I, "It's actually just a rhetorical question." I've already Googled you and see there are none. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, that I wasn't so very hard. nice of me. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. laughed so hard. <laughs> I used to be a debater, you know. So I used to do academic debates in high school, and so we wouldn't really talk like this, but we would sometimes. So yeah. <laughs> I have uh, an argumentative vein, and actually, I try to, you know, keep um, this under control because I know it risks uh, going into rhetorical discussion and arguments and so on. But in that particular case, I thought the discussion was so. But actually, what I hated in that particular case was that this person stopped replying to me and just started. Um, retweeting which is like a classical strategy you have a lot of followers you want them to commiserate you and whatever whatever but yeah i don't really i no, don't really what, what you're saying, what you're saying is what what angered you was instead of engaging with you in the reply yeah this person would quote engage, tweet you repeatedly yeah. yeah and by quote tweeting you what they would quote do is tweeting, drag yeah, right. your mob of minions of uh of uh, obviously intellectual giants. No, I mean, just, you know, the mob of people on Twitter. And then the, all those people would just pile into your replies to the point where, you know, it would be overwhelming. And and I yes. think you're right. This is a tactic. People use it. I mean, I think I see it a lot. They don't reply. They quote tweet, especially people with a, a large followers. Um, but but let's go back to the... <laughs> okay. You were joking, of course. And, um, and, uh, and it, but it was, it was, it was, it was quite a joke. Um, but, but I think there's, I don't know, there's something here, you know, um, uh, you, you and I, I don't think we're, we're not credentialists, i.e. that, you know, we're happy to hear a good argument or read a good paper from anybody with any credentials. You know, I don't think we're, we're not purists Absolutely. to say only the full professors of the world um, shall dare comment uh, because also, you know, we are ECRs. I don't know. We'll talk about that. That's the next topic. <laughs> we, we're, we're early career research. We're ECRs. We are, and by definition, you know, people may dispute, but I'm in my sixth year of faculty and I don't know how many years you are out and I won't dare ask, but I think if you're less than 10 by NIH definition, you're an ECR early yeah, career. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, we're ECRs. I think I restarted the clock. So I'm in my yeah, you, third okay. year because yeah. I restarted the clock. That's good. I want, I wish there was some way I could restart the clock with, uh, you know, with my face and everything, my, you know, I mean, I could restart the whole <laughs> clock, but okay. Well, you know, okay. So anyway, you said, uh, what are your scientific contributions? Okay. But, but I guess what I want to come what I want to talk, what I want to ask you about is there's something you're getting at, which is, um, you know, there are different places somebody could contribute. Um, you can be a blogger, you can do YouTube videos, you can do uh, podcasts, and and look, who are you talking to? I, I you know, I'm, I'm active on all those spaces. Um, but there is something to be said for scientific contributions. Not It's not the only thing one can do in life, but it is a type of contribution. And it's not the same thing as this podcast. I mean, as much as I love this podcast, I think it's the greatest podcast on earth. Uh, <laughs> it's not a scientific contribution. And if I put it on my CV and I said, you got to give me tenure because of this podcast. And they said, what the fuck are you talking about? I mean, I guess I, I, don't, have a, I don't have a leg to stand on. So I guess I wonder if you might say, um, you know, um, 
I don't know. Uh, your your reply was I found very funny. Um, but I wonder if you might talk about what does it mean to have a scientific what does a scientific contribution mean to you, and uh, and 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 why do you think that that is a goal worth pursuing? Yeah. So uh, I in that particular reply, actually, what what I meant was that um, basically the the person in question wasn't really. Um, Actually, I think understanding the the article that they were talking about completely, <laughs> yeah. and also not they were not. I mean, we were speaking in parallel. So basically, it, the article in question was Peter Doshi's anti-vaxxer piece, oh, right? Yeah. And so I was making the point that okay, this is somebody coming from a background of a lot of contributions about data sharing and clinical trial data and what should you be anal looking for, you know, clinical study reports and so on. So it has a mountain of contributions and. Even if you could agree from, from a specialist perspective, from a lay perspective, he was wrong in that point and his arguments were wrong, you have to give him the, the point that he's coming from, which was, we never know, we always want the full data, give us the clinical uh, study reports, adjudication is always a problem, why this and not that, I mean, this is his background. So at the same time, I was being directed A to read a blog when I just said I read the paper and know the man's work. So why do I need your blog, right? I mean, sorry, but I really don't need your blog if I read the article. Yes. And secondly, I was being told that whatever, whatever, I, we don't care what he did in the rest. Of, well, he could be great. But here, 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 you know, he was anti-vaxxer propaganda and, and whatever. And I mean, I think that's a very, very dangerous and also very silly, to be honest, uh, thing to take. But but I was also insisted by the fact that, you know, we were talking in parallel. I kept being sent to the blog. I yes. kept saying, I will not read that stupid blog. <laughs> in the end, I, I yeah, did yeah. go to the blog and I looked if there was something extra. And, yeah. and there really wasn't. So it yeah. was a, a more superficial reading uh, of, of uh, Peter Doshi's uh, opinion piece. But then also a lot of inaccuracies that once they get repeated on Twitter, they became uh, true, you know, who made him editor. They also made him editor of BMJ now. And I'm, I said, yeah, he's been editor for a while. He yes, rejected my while. paper, so I know. <laughs> you know, I have mails signed by him, rejection mails, right? So I don't yeah. have any. I don't know, that doesn't matter. I mean, he's still a little, but you know, the, the, the the lie is there already, or the inaccuracy. I don't think yes. the person was trying to lie, but the narrative already gets painted. You know, yeah. the BMJ, the journal is rewarding him from anti vaxxer Is it all connected, right? So I was, and to 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 top this, I mean, me or no one with three thousand followers, I woke up as you said, retweeted by 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 this um, large account, blue flag account, as, as you call them. I don't know if he has it, but should. Uh -huh. Who, uh, uh, and, and of course, then, you know, the random followers come and say, have you, do you know his contributions? He's the great, so, you know, the, the random fans. So, uh, yeah, all... that wasn't, uh, I mean, I try very hard to keep my debater personality in check, yeah. but sometimes, you know, oh, too many things align. But getting back to your point yes. about credentials, I yes. do think you have to have some credentials. They don't need to be a certain type of degree. So I'm not on the trust me, I'm a psychologist movement. Sure. But they <laughs> do need to be a certain yeah. type of papers, right? I mean, if you've never, um, in this case, if you've never analyzed what pharmaceutical companies yeah. are reporting, and if you've never really done any research on conflict of interest yourself, and you just read a few papers, maybe a lot of papers, but for sure, it's not like you digged into the literature yourself. You can't really play at the same level with somebody who's been researching this, looking into this, working into this. For, for, you just can't. I mean, it's not a question about uh, expertise being democratic. Of course, you can have great ideas, but it, it's just you don't know the beast you're dealing with, right? And so, I mean, I guess that to put a blogger uh, on the same level as Peter in terms of Peter's own expertise and it's just crazy, I think, uh, in, in, you know, I mean, exaggerate. So I, I, guess, I guess that that's a point that people don't like to hear this point. And all of us are often outside of our lanes. But it's also a question of not getting angry when somebody tells you, well, maybe while being outside of your lane, you said something that is not really correct. And in this case, you, you misunderstood the man's point, which was about full data sharing. And who knows if that had become a battle 
right. taken forward by my people. Who knows? Maybe we would have this data now and maybe they would be used. Who knows, right? But you just painted him as, as an anti-vaxxer because some journals right. took his piece here in Italy too and just took a quote from it and said, well, Peter don't approve vaccines or not. And yeah. I so guess I, I guess two, that's where uh, I'm coming from. That's, I mean, it's very well said. I mean, there's two buckets of things we can talk about. So let's we'll, we'll put the Peter Doshi on the second bucket. But the first bucket I want to talk about is, you know, I, 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 uh, I get what you're saying, which is the sense that, um, and, you know, I've written articles saying, and, and, you know, we've also seen throughout this pandemic that some of the accounts that are the most savvy, um, I, I was reading somebody who said that, you know, per, this person argued, this person has no background in medicine. I think this person's background in maybe even in art. And this person said that it is possible that one of the reasons why many infectious disease physicians are reluctant to be critical of Anthony Fauci is that they are worried, maybe wrongly, but they are worried that since he controls the funding of the uh, NIAID, uh, that their own funding may be jeopardized. And I thought that's actually kind of an astute point. I mean, I think that might yeah. be one of the reasons, even if it is not true that he plays a hand in direct day-to-day -day administration of NIAID funds, that might be one of the reasons why they are reticent. And this is an art person, so this person has no background, but yet this person has sniffed out, I think, something that is actually pretty close to the truth. However, that is different than what you're talking about, which is if you want to take a deep di dive into CSRs, um, clinical study reports, and you want to really reanalyze, uh, re perform a reanalysis of trials, looking at harms, benefits, primary endpoint adjudication, potentially missing harms, um, you, you, it helps to know a little bit uh, uh, have some experience doing that. And, and I guess, um, I guess we're bleeding into the next part. Um, and so, uh, the, but to come on to the first part, I want to, I want to say is like, you know, I, I am somebody who writes blogs and op-eds and, and do these videos, et cetera. Uh, it's a different standard. It's a different way of speaking. Um, then when you publish academic papers and, and, to, and, and, to, and to say that blogging is useless, that's, I, I don't think that's what you're saying, but to say you learn nothing from publishing rigorous papers, I think is mistaken. You learn a lot. Uh, and, and doing that work teaches you a lot. And it also, uh, okay. So then the next bucket, uh, um, labeling somebody, I mean, I think this is how it got you. I think you were rightly irritated was that, you know, Peter Doshi has done a number of very interesting work, including, uh, you know, he's one of the collaborators on the Tamiflu reanalysis that appeared, uh, which is probably one of the best uh, pieces of, uh, uh, of of reanalysis from the point of first principles of CFSR all the way up by led by Jefferson and colleagues in the BMJ. Um, and he's done a number of great work on transparency, uh, reproducibility. Um, and he has uh, pushed, I think, on some vaccine policies in the past. I think he uh, has written about whether or not healthcare workers should get mandatory influenza vaccines. Yeah. Um, but I think it is a mistake and inaccurate and actually <coughs> a bit defamatory and also um, a, a bit uh, anti-intellectual to label him as an anti-vaxxer. He's not an anti-vaxxer. He is a, uh, a person who has a certain point of view, um, who is a very rigorous appraiser of medical evidence. And you may disagree with this point of view, as you point out, but the moment you start adding that kind of epithet, that loaded epithet in this world, you know, it's like, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, like, it's like saying somebody is sexist, you know, or, or racist or anti-vaxxer. It's a loaded word um, and should be wielded very carefully uh, and not just applied to anybody who does anything that you don't like uh, in an effort to discredit them and undermine them. And I think that was really the root of your particular debate. But I thought it was a sort of a more interesting, broader commentary, which is that, you know, I'm looking at your um, CV. You've published many meta-analyses, many um, sort of umbrella studies, many studies on data sharing, reproducibility, um, many studies on the ability of randomized trials. Uh, would it be fair to say you've learned some things by doing that work over the last uh, five to 10 years? Yeah, definitely. And I mean, uh... So my, you didn't mention, but my comment was reported. So I looked at your Google Scholar profile and you have no work on vaccines. Well, I was talking about exactly what you say, data sharing, information that you find in one source, but you don't find in the other, going to the, uh, the, the study report and seeing if the adjudication about has changed. So it, it, it was just another, um, but, but, but yeah, it fit with this point because it, it just proves that when I look at the Google Scholar uh, profile of somebody talking about the efficacy of vaccines, then yeah, I look at studies about uh, vaccine efficacy, trial design, and what what not. When I look at the the CV of somebody uh, referring to that particular viewpoint, I, I look for something else. And 
So yeah, I, I would definitely say I learned a lot and I don't start as a meta analyst. Actually, I was somebody who did experimental research and uh, I was doing very, very paradigmatic research. So mm -hmm. I came from a clinical background and in psychotherapy, we have these psychotherapies, which are basically the creation of a founder who creates an entire system. So intellectually, it's very provocative, but then there are so many pieces and you have this big complex program that works or works for some, mm -hmm. but you just don't know what of it works and does anything make sense and some concepts are better defined and not. So I, what I was trying to do is just yeah. take some of these concepts and try to mm, infuse them in experimental studies and it completely failed because um, there was no way to uh, mix the two basically when I was doing it more uh, close to what was done in therapy then it became too complicated for the participants where i was simplifying a lot it became very simplistic so but but i come from that background and i, I haven't done the research in well soon it will be 10 years and and then just then i went to meta-analysis first of clinical interventions and then when i started to um, work more broadly with john yanidis as well more really direct meta research work and in this process i kept learning a lot because if i start on a topic then i say i don't know this i don't know that then i yeah. retrieve this and these papers so it kind of um is is a bit frustrating to uh i have to let's say play in a field where all this is normalized so i mean i don't have an epidemiology degree obviously and i i i don't i'm a psychologist by training but about meta-analysis, meta-research, I have learned a lot of things and implemented them in publications. So I can make a, 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 an opinion in that case, right? A documented opinion. To what you said about blogs, I, I think blogs are great and blogs are very important and, and somebody needs to translate that study that no one reads, right? Uh, apart from the abstract and maybe the highlights. So it's very, very important. And, and I mean, I appreciate, for instance, your blogs, a lot of other blogs. I, I don't know the literature and somebody gives me the... But if I tell you I know the paper and I actually know the background of the of paper course. too, and you tell me to read the blog, I mean, the blog might be fantastic, really. It might be fantastic. By the way, the paper was sort of a blog comment. Of so course, that would course. be a blog on a blog, right? So the paper, I, might, the blog might really be fantastic. This is not the case. The blog this is, is not the case. Not yeah, great. and you know, I think that I think the other distinction to draw is their blogs and their blogs. What do I mean by blat? I mean, um, you know, I write for MedPage today. There is an editorial review process. There is an editor. There is multiple yeah. editors. They edit it. They review it. Uh, sometimes they send it to a, some external party. If it's about infectious disease, they'll send it to an ID doctor. They'll make sure that the ID doctor doesn't see yeah. any overcome pitfalls. Uh, there's also posting on your own website. I've done that too in the past, but posting on your own website, you can post whatever the shit you, whatever you want. You post whatever shit you want on their website. And you know, I don't know exactly what blogs you're being directed to, but I suspect they might be just posting on your own website, which is not really the same. Yeah. Thing. Um, okay, let's put that aside. I mean, I, I, I guess I, you're not, you don't need to persuade me because I know that you're right. <laughs> I just found it quite funny. Um, yeah, but I do think there's something to be said for scientific contribution. You do learn a lot, and I do think. Um, you know, I think it was just, uh, I mean, frankly, I think defamatory stuff about Peter Doshu, who's a very thoughtful person. He's been at Maryland and he's a tenured associate professor there. And he's done a lot of important scientific contributions to the literature, whether anyone likes it or not. And he is not an anti or vaxxer. Uh, he's also not an anti anti vaxxer. He's not any of these labels. He's a, uh, I think, a careful researcher. Um, and then the last thing I'd say is to your point about epidemiology, I mean, you learn some things in, um, you know, certainly people who do a PhD in epidemiology learn some things. When I did my MPH, I took the uh, epidemiology PhD series in terms of the classes. You do that for a couple of years and then you go on to your research. So yes, you learn things in epidemiology and then you do your research, but you know, publishing for 10 years in the space, you learn some things too. Uh, you learn yeah. perhaps often all the things you would have learned in a PhD without actually receiving the PhD. Um, and then the last thing I would say about vaccine regulation, I mean, I think you know, I mean, I, I've been involved in a lot of debates about uh, emergency use authorization and regulatory approval. And, uh, you know, uh, it's kind of painful for me to debate with people who haven't played in the sandbox of regulatory approval. You know, I, I, I have spent five years getting a, a deep dive into how FDA approves products. And, and, and so that is something I'm very interested in. Um, yeah. Anyway, let me come to the next, the next topic I want to talk to you about early career researchers. We're both ECRs, obviously. Uh, I'm in my sixth year as Always. faculty. Yeah. And you had a restart. You had the restart. You you found, uh, uh, you know, you had the restart and you're an ECR. Um, okay. Um, 
I, 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 no, know, I would have been on ECR without it as well. My PhD you would, yeah, exactly right. You would have been ECR without it. Yes. So here they count, yeah, from your date of your PhD. You're 24 years old. You would have been an ECR one way or the other. So yeah. one, one, one yeah. way or the other, you'd have been I'm a ECR. master's student. Yeah. <laughs> master's student. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, I guess what I want to say is, you know, when, when you and I were training, I didn't even hear the word ECR. I never heard that. No, now I hear either. it a lot. Yeah. Um, okay. I wonder if you might explain, how do you balance the two things? One, um, <clears throat> you want to give ECRs opportunities to shine. You want people who are early career to feel supported and welcomed. Uh, on the other hand, you can't like not have any standards at all. Uh, you can't, um, you know, just give everyone a full professorship when they're, you know, right out of fellowship or whatever. Um, and, you know, there is something to be said for, you know, um, is it tactful to publicly talk about, you know, I mean, I think you can talk about your paper got rejected, but when people start disclosing what, you know, people said, this is, you know, technically confidential stuff. Um, I don't know, how do you balance that between supporting an ECR and, you know, the worry that an ECR doth complain too much? I mean, how do you strike, how do you think about that? Yeah, so I, I have to make a distinction here because my background is more is very different from yours. So I come from an Eastern European country. We didn't have, so if you sent your paper and it got rejected, you wouldn't even dare. I mean, you would think, <laughs> how could I screw up so badly now? And what can I, in fact, in, with my first paper, which I think is a very important learning opportunity because we didn't have all the resources then and even my PhD coordinator. So he's somebody who always published, but I wrote my first paper myself and it was from my master thesis and I thought it was amazing. So I really thought they would die after it. Really. And it wasn't even formatted, right? So it was just so horrible. It was long and it yeah. was, and these people yeah. actually gave me a review, but it, it's not the rejection. So I didn't mind the rejection. I just understood maybe for the first time and in a series of rejections, how far away I was from the paradigm. Now, probably this isn't happening now. And for sure, it isn't happening if you come from a top American university where you're already trained, you know, for undergraduate. But my, my deeper point is that when, <laughs> when I, back in my time, when I was in ECR, we would not be outraged by rejections. We would, I would always modify my, I would do everything the reviewer said, even if the paper was rejected. In fact, the first time a professor told me if your paper was rejected and they don't want it, just don't bother. Just go on with the submission. I was shocked. I was, what shouldn't we be doing? All the things they said, and look, they said this, and that's what they said, and So I was like, nah, nah, they, they don't want. So I guess I come also from, from a very, very different culture in terms of uh, what's expected from you. And, and maybe it's not a good culture being, it, it's not that you're expected to be submissive, but for sure they're not expected to whine too much. And I mean, I'm sorry, this is not very political correct as I say it like that, but you're, I mean, I had a very good run. I had the department of young people, a boss that was research oriented. And I know I could have ended up worse uh, in, in, in a department where it wouldn't have mattered, where you would have been, to be nice to, to the people already working there. And I never had to do that. We were always about the practical and the science and, and everything. But I never got, well, I don't know, I'm going to sound like such a right-wing person, but I never got pampered, you know? That, it was never, um, the most I got, you know, it was try to do your best with these reviews, send the paper again. So getting back to your question now, it's, I don't know what's right in terms of ECRs. I work with some ECRs and I mean, there are some PhD students and some postdocs and I, 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 I see this firsthand. So their manuscripts need a lot of improvement and uh, I see them progressing and I see, I, I try to step in to, you know, to encourage when they are very down in terms of this is irrelevant, I can't do this. Uh, you know, for instance, with meta-analysis, we have a, yeah. often a problem that we are yeah. finishing a project, ready to submit, and something similar just got published. I know. Doing, exactly. So I had this, this scooping thing. I didn't <coughs> scoop you. They thought about it before you. Yeah. And, and there, I think it's kind of my role to tell this person, look, mm -hmm. you can trust me. We're going to publish this. If it's well done and well reported, 
they are going to publish and it's all it's always i mean i i, I see my role in that way i yeah. don't see my role in saying reviewers are stupid everything is unfair um you, I, I don't know it but this can also be a lot from my cultural background and, and maybe i do have some kind of biases that i have to overcome in terms of how junior is junior and then i i don't have this in terms of authority so i don't think you know, there's a basis necessarily for authority has to be gained. It's not that if you're a full professor, I'm just the assistant professor or the ICR, as you say, um, I, you're necessarily, but there is something to be said about expertise. And even in terms of sheer numbers, you know, uh, in terms of just doing this for a while, there's something, I, I want to share a funny anecdote here uh, about being an ICR, which was the first time I realized that it, it you're on the American Twitter and the American Twitter is very different from the rest of the world Twitter. Yeah. But uh, so uh, there was some kind of uh, discussion in open science psychology. And I was, I think I said something a bit aggressive to this one person. And he said, how can you say this to me? You are a tenured professor and I'm an ACR. And at the time I was still working in Romania. And it's true, I was an associate professor there probably getting paid less than a PhD student in, in America, for uh -huh. sure getting paid less than this person working in Twitter. But it was just funny, so funny to me that he, in in many ways, a more privileged position, so working in a much richer right, country, right. better university, right. with more chances, you right. know, to publish and so on. And myself mm -hmm. working, yes, tenured, but, you know, under a lot of tasks that you right. have to do just by virtue right. of being there and with a low pay because these are the salaries in, in our countries. And with all this kind of um, um, ethos that you should... So when, when I worked uh, in Eastern Europe, you were basically supposed to be helping the research office. And you were so, so if you had the grant, you had to do things for the grant. You couldn't just tell the research right. office, yeah, well, I have these things, do it for me. You, you would be responding to that. And this is kind of the, the, the way we're used to work, but it's not that people are unkind. It's that we have so few resources that everybody is doing. And yeah, so I think, uh, I, I guess it's very, very hard to see this from a <clears throat> high income country perspective. Yeah. And uh, it's very hard to see how it looks like, but, but often the associate professor in a small country can be really in a more precarious position of than course. the ECR in, in an ECR in the Harvard Medical School. <laughs> in Australia. School. Yeah, or, yeah, or in the, the pinning at Harvard, an ECR from Harvard. At Harvard, yeah. An ECR yeah. from yeah. Harvard will fall backwards into a full professorship in, uh, uh, you know, in Romania. Right. Perhaps. Right. Yeah. So I have a few thoughts for you. Um, I, I, I also I also walk this line a little bit. One, um, one I agree with you 100%. Um, when I came out of uh, medical school, you know, I, uh, I, I don't think I had a lot of formal training in how to write academic papers. I had read a bunch, but I hadn't read 1,000. I hadn't read 10,000. I may have read 100. Um, and so I took a crack at writing a few papers and I would get rejections and some of the rejections would be harsh. And uh, the rejections were like, this is, you know, and then if I go back and read that paper, that is a shitty paper. They were right. I yeah. was no doubt about it. It was a shitty paper, but I didn't have the gall to basically like post it on some public website and say, here's my paper. It should have been accepted into nature. Why the fuck wasn't it accepted? You know, I didn't have that gall. I was like, what has gone on? I take my lickings quietly. And, you know, maybe it is cultural for me. Yeah, too. Yeah. You know, my parents from, you know, I guess I'm a child of an Im of immigrants and, um, you know, we wouldn't get away with, I mean, I could never imagine telling my, uh, my parents would not, and they would not condone that behavior. You got a bad grade. If you were to yeah. allege that the bad grade was a result of the bad teacher who was unfairly grading, uh, that would not fly. No. <laughs> that wouldn't fly. They say, what the hell are you no, talking? Bad good. teacher. No, you got the bad grade because your paper could be better. You know, I mean, if they were, if, uh, you know, um, <laughs> I can't even imagine. Yeah, like, yeah they, I can say the same about my They, they don't yeah. indulge that way of thinking. Um, the next thing I would say, you know, um, uh, I think like a few, I, I don't know, when I criticize a paper, I never take into account who is the author. And I think many years ago, there were like two papers I, I got in like pushback, like you did, for criticizing. One paper was, it was some paper that said, if you drank more coffee, you're less likely to have colorectal cancer death after a colorectal cancer surgery, so an adjuvant trial. 
And then I was like, mm-hmm. this paper is obviously total bullshit. It's not even not even possible that this is true. Every drug that reduces the risk of colorectal cancer recurrence has a strong activity when you administer it in metastatic colorectal cancer. If you pour coffee into colorectal cancer, it's not going to do anything. It is, an, it is just 100% spurious association. And somehow you've managed to publish in a good journal. Um, you should not be proud of that. Uh, your mentors yeah. are... I mean, whoever did the, whoever was behind this paper should be disappointed. This is adding to the pollution of science. Why a lot of people rightly distrust science. Anyway, I was, I, but I didn't know who wrote the paper. I just saw the paper, read the paper. It was terrible. I criticized it, and then later somebody was like, "Oh, you know, somebody junior was a, is like the first author of that paper." I say, "Okay, you know, it wasn't it wasn't personal. You know, I'm not saying that this junior person kicks puppies or anything like that. But what I am saying is this <laughs> paper is not helpful, and it didn't help anybody, and it's actually really harmful." You know, in sort of an existential way to what we want to do in science. And then the other example was something about phase one studies I criticized once. Um, they said that the response rate in a phase one trial is like 25%. And I was like, that's not even possible. It's not even close no. to possible. And of course, it was because of, you know, the selection bias of their study. And then somebody was like, well, it's a medical student who is the first author. I was like, you know, it, okay, yes, of course. But the problem isn't the medical student. The problem is the last author who told the medical student to do this obviously flawed project. And it, the problem is the system that permits certain flawed answers to publish, but not other flawed answers. Because if the flawed answer fits the narrative, it's published. And if the flawed answer doesn't fit the narrative, uh, it's not published. Or if they're chasing the altmetric score, like the coffee, uh, they'll publish it. But if they don't care, you know, if it's not going to generate altmetric, they won't. And then I guess the next thing I would say is, so I think, you know, um, I, I agree with you 100% that like, as somebody who has people who work, who I work with, who are uh, uh, at an earlier career stage than me, I, I don't even say the word mentor because I don't think I am their mentor in any way, shape, or form. Uh, uh, but I advise them. Uh, what do I advise them? I advise them um, a few things. I advise them uh, to, you know, really know where you want to submit to, not to take erroneous criticism to heart, to keep plugging away and trying, to pick projects that I think are very low likelihood of being scooped. Um, and then I also think that like, you know, some of my uh, most provocative papers were rejected the most in part because, you know, they cut against vested interests. Um, yes. So, and, and then the last thing I'd say is like the real problem with this ECR structure is it is a pyramid structure. There's way too many PhDs for faculty spots. We're training too many. And I don't think anyone wants to just admit the reality, which is, I don't think I th- we're training too many. And you know what? We're training them because we want the free labor force, but w- they're not jobs for them. And, and some of them go on to do work outside of the academy you know, honestly, they don't need a PhD for that work. A lot of people could get by with the master's. So I think if you really want to fix the ECR problem, you would not create a culture where every paper should be published in nature and everybody should get a pat on the back because some papers are not worthy of that. You'll create a culture where you don't have a glut of uh, exploitative training and you actually just train more master's people or put people into, you know, the right career for them earlier. Yeah, I agree. And, and again, it, it's very uh, interesting for me to see how, how I see this and how it's seen from, from the other side. So for instance, I was thinking now while you were talking about my um, collaborators who are ECRs in the sense that they are PhD students. And when I, before I transferred to Italy, uh, I had grants where I worked and I would pay them from these grants because uh, they don't get any stipend as PhD students there. Just a few people get a scholarship and the rest just have to, you know, um, put things together to survive it really. And so my main stress was A, that they will not have funding and that they will not just be able, I mean, it's really a question of, 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 of survival in the sense that they were continuing to doing this work with me and for right. the PhD, but I felt responsible and sure and funding. The other one is actually one of my most, uh, I would call him one of the most uh, brilliant students I work with, PhD students, he's finishing his PhD now. And so with him, we had two papers, two papers, which both got rejected after we had revisions and we did everything asked by revisions. So this happened three times to me in my entire career. And I did, a, I mean, I did a fair amount of submissions and every time it was with him. So you would send the detailed response to revisions and you would be like, yes, okay, this is in. And then, so with him, for me, it was very, I mean, this is a very stoic person and he's a very stoic guy. He's like, yeah, this is what I have. This is, But with him, it was very important for me to kind of lift him up and, and, and tell him that, okay, this, this you know, it's a, such a rare occurrence right. and this is just bad luck. 
bad luck. Huh? And in fact, we did publish both papers in the end, and we published the journals on par with the ones. That, but it's just this kind of, uh, just to say that from our side, and, and it's more a question of, will I still have money to do this, any kind of research tomorrow? Can I still get involved in this? And mm, this kind of, of more, um, Mm, practical so to speak issues and I do see my role in stepping in this I could step for a friend and I could say look I I mean I've been there I know it, it's not I don't see my role in saying this kind of thing that you know we always have these stereotypes about Americans that they always say everything is great everything is awesome and fabulous and then nothing is so no I mean some papers are just really good and some papers are just medium. And this is why I thank God for, you know, and some papers are just, we start from the, of, of the list and it's just fine. I mean. That's great. Yeah, so uh, hold, just, hold on one second. Okay, we were just saying. Um, yes, I agree with you. I agree with you that, um, you know, when when uh, a, a, uh, a trainee has the misfortune of getting the bad luck. I've had few too, where, you know, one trainee got all their papers accepted on like a second journal. And then one trainee got like every paper rejected eight times. And, you know, they only have two papers each or yeah. something like that. And then the paper, the person who's just getting an unlucky draw twice, you want to tell them like, this is not typical. You don't have a typical experience. But I also don't like to, um, I don't know. I don't like to delude people either, which is that like people tell me like, um, oh, you know, um, you know, I guess in my line of work, I work with so many clinical doctors. And the thing about being a clinical doctor is, you know, it's so much easier to earn your pay by just seeing patients. In fact, that's what I've done a lot of when I've been in a pickle before as well. Um, and it's harder to get the grants. And it's easier to get certain type of grants than other type of grants. And the meta research type of grants are the hardest grants to get. Yeah. You know, it's, it's just the way of the world. And so if like, uh, you know, people come to me and they ask for like career advice, um, um, you know, they ask for career advice of like, you know, well, how do I get a grant? Um, uh, should I go into policy? I mean, I, 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 I advise them not like out of a self-interest or anything. I just advise them like, here are the probability. You want to go down this path, your odds of success are like X, you know, you want to go down these other paths, your odds of success are Y. It's up to you. But, you know, if I, yeah. if somebody sat me down 10 years ago and told me all this, maybe I wouldn't be here. You know, I'd be doing something, <laughs> I'd take that other path. What the hell was wrong with me? I was like, actually, I do wonder. I'm like, God, I do wonder. Yeah. No, I wonder. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah. Uh, especially, actually, it's just one, one little. Shot. I was like, you yeah, folks in private practice. I really, I, I, I wonder a lot of times because you know I love practice. Um, okay. Um, but I want to ask you this question. Um, uh, about about this. Um, you know, I guess this is what I guess. I guess the full disclosure is this is why I think you and I get along so well because um, there's something about this that it's it's. I think maybe cultural, maybe personal ethic and these kinds of things. And then, you know, maybe we have similar sort of sense of values and preferences here. And, and that's why we see so eye to eye. Um, you wanted to say one more thing about this before I, I shift topics? Say what no, 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 um, no, 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 yeah. Okay. The next thing I wanted to ask you, reproducibility. Um, actually, actually, I'll come to reproducibility in a second. Let me just talk, let's talk about the other, the, the topic of COVID-19. Um, you are somebody who I would describe as a centrist. You have centrist. reasonable beliefs. Uh, you believe in trade-offs. Um, how do you feel when you go on? I guess, I guess I just, I'm just honest. I just, I'll tell you what, how I feel. And you tell me if you feel the same. When I look at, um, you know, uh, many people ask me like, you know, well, why you keep commenting about COVID? And I said, uh, I didn't want to. I certainly didn't want to. I got dragged into it. And why did I get dragged into it? I mean, the first March, April, May, I think I was pretty quiet. I published two things with Jeff Flyer, one about, you know, the need to hear people with diverse points of view. Duh. And two, you know, the fact that you probably need people at the table who have diverse expertises from historians because it hits every domain. Duh. Uh, but then the thing that broke my spirit that made me comment more and more was the schools. We got to the fall. And in this country, they didn't even open the schools. And I was like, okay, well, you know, shouldn't open schools if there's rip roaring community spread. They didn't open the schools where there's no COVID. They just didn't open the schools at all. And I was like, what the hell are you, why are you closing the school when there's no COVID? What does that accomplish? And then I started reading about it. And I was like, this is a no brainer. Schools do all this good. And if you close it, you're going to get, you're going to screw yourself. And, and if, and it doesn't even be seem to account for much of the spread. And then when I go on Twitter 
I was, I think it made me comment even more than I would have because it is not the center of all the people I know in my life who are professors and academics and doctors. Um, it's the center, it's, it's the extreme fear. I'm like, it is really, uh, it's to the point of like irrational fear. Um, you know, they keep talking about variants, but I'm pretty soon next, they're going to talk about like the next pandemic flu. They're going to say, they're going to start talking about, you never know when the next pandemic is coming. Yeah. You could jump out of a pangolin tomorrow. Uh, so anyway, I wonder if you look at it the same way. You've gotten in some battles with some people who are notorious fear mongers, in my opinion. Um, how do you think about COVID Twitter? Uh, and and you, But you stay out of it a little bit. Yeah, so I think COVID Twitter is actually getting a lot better. Okay. So I think a lot of accounts, uh, that were uh, have mm. migrated towards uh, maybe not centrist but very balanced position. It's actually much more of a pleasure to read now. Maybe also because maybe I'm blocked by the 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 more extremist accounts. <laughs> yeah, maybe, it, maybe, yeah. Yeah. So there is uh, there is I mean perceptibly from where I stand, there is a diversity of opinions now that wasn't there in, in as for and, and for as much as people will say no, in fact, epidemiologists from the beginning were saying how complex it is. Eh? I can count the people from uh, who from the beginning uh, were saying okay this is complex it's a dilemma meaning we have absolutely no good ways out we just need to look at trade-offs and so on so for instance one person that has been consistently saying that and you had him on uh, was uh, professor Balu from UCL oh yes Francois Balou. who as I mean he, you could frame his series of tweets from February where he was saying if we do this it will be like this and it will be bad if you we do the opposite it will also be bad. So I see this is a problem with no good solution. And I mean, he was right. Yeah. So that said, I do see some progress now and in terms of, but there is also a question of uh, a few, a few, many COVID influencers who really have a very, very, very narrow tunnel vision of, of what it means. And I mean, we see it now, now in Europe, there is a big, we don't have the school debate so much. We do have the, because schools mostly stayed open, except for, uh, for the last time. We do have the border control debate a lot, which now is being cast in 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 in, in very very problematic terms with people without even realizing that when you are speaking about leaky borders or people making it through our borders, you're and I mean I'm somebody who my family is in another country. If I don't exit the border, I cannot. I I remember the reality before the European Union. I needed a visa for everything, and right. you wouldn't be sure you would get the visa to go to Germany with my parents. We actually had to spend the night by the consulate. We had a special invitation written by a friend of my grandfather, who also this person who was an old person had to go and make all this invitation guarantee for us. And, and still, even you know, with all your paperwork, the yeah. minute you approach the border, yes. you knew there could be trouble. You <laughs> knew you were at the mercy of people yes. saying, "Well, you know what? I'm just going to keep you here for three hours and maybe send you home now." Yes. And so I, I, I admit I'm a bit, um, maybe not traumatized. It would be too much, but I, I remember that reality very, very well. Yes. So for somebody like me, when you take uh, free travel off the table. That, that's a very, very big thing. And it, it's, I, I just see that the discussion is, is, is being held at a very, very superficial level where you're so, well, people, you know, can vacation within the country? Or, well, uh, what was being said last year, everyone has to uh, sort of uh, stand some costs and so on. The same thing about schools. So one thing that was very little talked about here when schools were closed and parks were closed last year in 2020 is that some kids were living in very, very, very bad situations. Like a lot of people in the house and without a balcony, without a garden. Not everyone has a garden here. Crammed spaces. And what drew attention to this uh, paradoxically was not um, so much psychologists and even if it should have been us. There were actually some pediatricians who started to say, look, we see these kids and they are so listless and without energy. And to one mom, I just right. said, you know what, just take her a bit outside. So it's kind of, uh, I would have hoped this year we learned from this kind of mistake right. and realize that if for an adult, you can say, stay home, watch Netflix and whatnot, get your, uh, there are other kinds of, so, and Europe did learn because schools did stay open. Yes, and Europe to be fair, some, some countries never really closed the, the elementary schools. And even here 
in Italy this year, at some point, the decision was taken to um, close the small grades. And then they quickly came back to that and said, no matter what the incidence rate is, we will still keep up to primary open because it, it's impossible for her. So uh, I guess what I'm saying is that for a lot of, of, of COVID influencers, what I don't like is the, the conflation between your prejudices and your belief. I mean, prejudice in the sense of stereotypical beliefs about issues that don't touch you directly. Yeah. So, and, and then you transform this into expertise. Yeah. So you conflate uh, personal fears or personal beliefs or trade-offs that you made for yourself. Yes. And you uh, kind of conflate them with expertise. Now we will say as a public health expert, I tell you that borders should be, but you don't need those borders open, right? If your kid was on the other side uh, in India and you live in Australia, you would yeah. definitely be thinking about this differently. And I mean, it's, I think it's good that we speak about this openly. What yes. are we most afraid of? Are you most afraid of uh, um, immunocompromised or an old relative, a close relative dying? Is that where your fear is? Are you most afraid of not seeing people? Are you most afraid of, I don't know, your, your children not uh, getting what, are, are you most afraid of being hungry? Because, yes. well, some are most afraid of, of this. Yes. And, and another thing that I would like to um, point here about uh, the example of Italy. So, you know, Italy last year had a very, very strict lockdown. And actually, to be fair, the government was not trying to be cruel. They were trying to do their best and they did put some kind of system in place where you would get some money and so on. But it really took a TV show that showed some of the most horrific scenes I've seen. So actually, on the one hand, there were scenes of people dying of COVID. On the other hand, there were scenes of regular people robbing supermarkets because this is where they were. Wow. So, you know, the government after that quickly traced back and said, you know what, we'll just give cash. You need cash. But it, it kind of took the, the media to show this reality, yeah. to show that, uh, you know, you would have another case that they showed this old person calling the ambulance because he did not have food, not because he was sick, but he just right. did not have food. And, and you would have people from humanitarian organization and you would have the queues to the food banks. And it's kind of, you know, when, when I read analysis that say that lockdown was better economically, <laughs> I mean, and, and when, I, when, I, when I see the things about saying, well, we all need to suffer. I mean, I didn't suffer at all. I'm a public employee. Our salaries did not get touched. I see. Yes, we were expected to work from home, but we didn't go from having an income, maybe from a private business or maybe from a, a kind of entrepreneurial activity. There are so many people doing this with right. just surviving, you know, photographers, artists, and so on. Right. We didn't go from that to zero. And yeah, so, so I, I guess there's uh, a lot of lack of empathy and a lot of yeah. very narrow niche thinking in terms of, of, of what should be done. Sorry, I, I that's very well put. Here. <laughs> I know. I mean, I think I echo all those points. One, lack of empathy. People unable to imagine those in different circumstances. I heard so many people say, well, you know, my kids are fine. I was like, you're fucking rich with a doctorate. What are you talking about? Your kids, <laughs> you work at the university. Your job is secure. You can Zoom your whole life away. Your kids are fine. And some people, even with those resources, they said their kids aren't fine. That should be telling, right? And then imagine the kids you don't even yeah. see. They're not, they don't have the opportunity. Their parents can't spend the time sitting with them. I don't know, holding their uh, eyes or gluing their eyes to the laptop. Uh, so that was one thing I think is a failure. Um, the borders, I think, is a failure. I think there's another thing in America that makes it particularly bad, which is Americans have Americans make one cognitive error over and over again, which is if a little is good, a lot is better. Everything we do, we do a lot of. You come to our meal, <laughs> yeah, you, you come here, you get dinner, you bring so much food on them. A little is good, a lot is better. Yeah, if a little yeah, medicine yeah. is good, a lot is better. If a little school closure is good, a lot is better. And that's how we yeah. do everything. And so everything is a lot. Everything is a lot of school closure. We, you know, a lot of cities, it's 100% school closure for four, 370 days. Are you crazy? That is so bad. And, and, then, and then to have the, to lack the wherewithal to realize that what you will have come, you don't see the harm. You talk about the media. So I think this school is a great one. The media doesn't get to have a camera crew with the, with the kid who's trapped with the abuser right now. The media doesn't have a camera crew with the children who are going hungry because the media doesn't know who those kids are. They're lost. Yeah. Um, but they will eventually, they will find those kids and they're going to do something. And it's going to, I think we're really going to change public sentiment. Um, the influencers on Twitter, I don't, you know, I actually want to make one point about the ECR stuff. 
you know, um, you were you were talking about the ECR getting a rejection. They're complaining on Twitter. They're grousing about it. Um, what I want to say is, I don't know. There's two ways you can have your career. You can really be quiet about the majority of issues. You can be very quiet about it, just focusing your tiny little bucket of issues, and you and 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 be very polite and tactful and diplomatic and don't fight against a current. And you probably won't get a lot of animosity. But the moment you start to talk about the things in this world that really matter, the high and unsustainable price of drugs, how we develop compounds, how we actually test and assess drugs, whether or not they're untoward safety signals and things we think are safe. Uh, if the moment you try to push against people who have a lot of money and power, um, the people who run the trials, who are happy with the power structure, um, you will get some pushback. People are going to push hard on you. They're not going to be nice to you. They're going to call you things. They're going to hit you. They're going to kick you. And what I wish to suggest is if you are so hurt by the rejection on your paper, your first four papers, you're not going to be prepared for when you get to, I don't know, even the modest level I have on commenting things, when they kick the shit out of you online. You got to take the, You got to take their, they're going to kick you. And, you know, you and I both know there are a lot of people who've taken even more blows uh, this cycle um, for, you know, um, we, we could talk about, what's his name? Um, uh, uh, Ludvigsen from uh, Sweden, who published the New England Journal of Data on Kids. That guy has taken immense blows. Um, but what he did, I think, was a, uh, was a good. And history will view him favorably. Um, but, you know, you talk about having thick skin. You need to have thick skin if you want to do that. And even he, after some amount of time, couldn't take it anymore. And I think a number yeah. of people have gone quiet uh, because they couldn't take the blows anymore. Um, and, and I think that's bad. Um, so, I mean, it's twofold. One, they shouldn't be dealt the blows. But the other thing is we all have to be able to take more blows. Uh, if you want to push on the things that really matter in this world, if you want to push on things that nobody gives a shit about, which a lot of people I see, that's what they're doing, then fine, do whatever you want. But, you know, if you really want to push on things that matter, um, okay, then um, I guess we could say, I guess any closing thoughts, I guess, I, I think you, you said it very well. It's, I, I think the border closure COVID zero, COVID zero, what, why are we even talking? It's a fairy tale that exists on Twitter. It doesn't exist in the real world. We have an endemic <laughs> virus. What are you talking about? There's no zero, COVID zero. Gosh, I can't believe it. Yeah, that. but COVID zero, I mean, the, the problem is not COVID zero. I agree with you. There's no COVID zero. I mean, of course, I'm not an epidemiologist. This is my layperson opinion. My worry is that we try to get COVID zero. This is what scares me, that we will uh, put a concerted, Effort. I mean, I, I don't know if you've seen the BMJ series where they yes. talk about COVID zero. So I was waiting. What I wanted to see, and actually I've seen it, I have to say from the Twitter accounts of epidemiologists who talked about this in Canada, like, what does it take? How do we get to this yes. miraculous COVID zero? Yes. Because if you tell me three or four or five months of, of strict lockdown, of no schools, no yes. parks, no, it's kind of... Uh, I way differently this, this trade off, right? If you just tell me, well, think about it, COVID zero, we'd yes. have zero COVID. Wouldn't that be great? Sounds great. And and I mean, I, I'm, I mean, the, the example of COVID zero is often uh, obviously Australia. And I mean, I was very surprised that only us on the sort of centrist fringe were commenting last week when Australia had one of the or two weeks ago. Yeah, banned one the of citizens. The most, yeah. Yeah inhumane i mean inhumane is the word i mean it's not just about empathy you would think that as a citizen your you know your 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 state is responsible for you because you and and it, it's i mean I, I don't even know where to and, and why don't why don't the same public health accounts that talk about look there's a, a basketball game in australia look at all why aren't they talking about this afterwards, right? Particularly because a lot of people in this situation, and this has been um, emphasized, are not rich people and are definitely not white people and are, so are people with a lot of vulnerabilities. But I was thinking, even in the examples given, so let's say your kid is in India with their grandparents, what if all the adults around get sick? What happens? Who gets these kids back? I mean, aren't you the state responsible for your citizens, even if they are minors, you need to get them safe right. I, I, don't you have any responsibility right. so i kind of this kind of double standard i guess sort of um characterizes a lot of this very uh narrow yeah, yeah. uh eliminate COVID or or nothing uh slice of twitter but i have to say a lot of people are now having more i think nuanced positions yeah. even if they're weighing more in the direction or another there I think I think the simple fact that we have vaccination in the U.S. and the U.K. The moment you see the rates fall, 
the anxiety goes down and so people can think, use their brain for a little bit. I'll, I'll say one last thing about <laughs> these ID epidemiologists before I switch topics, which is, you know, I love ID epidemiologists. I loved them before they were cool. I mean, I always loved them. I think they're, they're, they're do interesting stuff and they have their models, some of which occasionally tell you something, many of which are often, often wrong, you know, whatever. They have, I, I have a Rolex watch that's broken. I uh, can't afford to fix it, but it's beautiful. Um, you know, and some models, it's like a, it's a broken watch. Okay, they love it. Okay, okay, but they're wonderful people. But you know what? They're not, and they're trained in what they do. They're trained in this infectious disease thinking and modeling. You know what they don't know, frankly? They don't do a PhD in what happens when you close schools for 370 days. They have no fucking clue. They have no clue what happens. And you know what? And, and to have the audacity to tell me that that's a reasonable thing to do, that's not a reasonable thing. It would be reasonable if the IFR was the opposite. If the IFR was that bad in the children and that low in the elderly, then I think it would be reasonable. But if the IFR is the way that it is, if it's this gradient, it makes no sense. Anyway, anyway, we, uh, I don't want to go on that. The next thing, you wrote this. Preserving equipoise and performing randomized trials for COVID-19 yeah. social distancing interventions. You are one of the very brave people. You, um, Florian, this is written with John. No, I can't say that. I can't say his name. The man in the white suit. Um, this is, um, this <laughs> is, uh, yeah, I can't, say, I can't say his name. I should have worn my white blazer out of solidarity. No, I, sh- I can't say his name. Uh, obviously, he's an evil person. He's been, you know, waiting, lying low for the moment to strike and be evil. Um, uh, um, uh, and Margaret McCartney, I think she wrote that nice piece in the BMJ. Yes. Uh, I, I, my piece, you, know, you, you had a chance to just glance at it, but, you know, we're, we got that submitted some places, so we'll see. Um, I want to talk about randomization. Um, you know, uh, I see a lot of people quickly quickly say, you can't do a cluster randomized trial of face shields. You can't do a cluster randomized trial of masks. You can't randomize essential business closures. You can't randomize 25% versus 50% capacity. You can't randomize these things. And here I see you write October, 20, October 2020, Epidemiology and Psychiatric Sciences. You say you can. So I wonder if you might explain this a little bit. Not only you say you can, you ought to. How do you, how do you define so- uh, actually, this, I mean, this work was uh, kind of collaborative in the sense that uh, I uh, had, actually, John had the idea, of, he just randomly said it out there in um, a metrics meeting, one of our research meetings, and he said, you know what, there, and this was in May of last year, and he said, we have all these non-pharmacological interventions, but there's no more equipoise. I mean, we're losing the, the, the equipoise component because we are no longer, everything is said like, this is what we must do now. And this is very important now. This is essential now. And the experts are putting themselves behind this. So we're kind of uh, uh, losing the opportunity to test all this. And in fact, at the time, at least, if you looked back to the evidence there was, for uh, many of the measures that were given, like this is what we must be doing, it was very weak. Okay, of course you cannot, you couldn't, you know, say, well, why didn't you do randomized trials or whatever at the Spanish flu pandemic, or why didn't you do? Uh, of course, this is the nature of the evidence. But so my contribution, let's say, to the paper was more on the um, equipoise part on and discussing the the consequence of looking at equipoise, and then Florian and, and also John who. Uh, put everything together. Florian is an expert in clinical trial design. And in fact, we did have a figure that we took out eventually with- So you're saying Florian wrote a design. few, he's, he's written three or four blogs on clinical trial design. Is that what you're saying? He's, he's, he's a, no, no, he's- He's actually He's actually written some papers on it. I see. Okay, okay, go on. Yeah, no, and, sorry. And, he didn't just write some <laughs> blogs. Okay, okay, good, good. Yeah. Good. Clarify. So yeah, we Florian actually, actually initially, we wanted to also put a, a figure about the step to edge and how it could be applied. And then John brought it all together with the discussion of outcomes and of timing. And in fact, if you read the papers, there's an entire roadmap of suggestions of we might do this or we might do that. And and some of these would have, I mean, actually what I think is funny is that some are being done now with a concert opening in Europe. So they are these randomized experiments, you know, where you test people, you make them enter in a, in a concert, a full concert like before, and then you see how many people uh, got sick so oh, something good. is being done yeah there's one in the netherlands and there was another one in spain i think one is being prepared in italy so in, in a way we've 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 arrived at getting randomized evidence but yeah so so actually at the time when we were submitting this we thought this might actually be an opportunity and there was the norwegian trial you know about, yes, about I remember closing and reopening schools and we weren't advocating yeah. for yeah for an all or nothing randomization. So you didn't even have to um, 
say, okay, one district open, one district closed, you could uh, test various doses of, of the intervention. That was another idea in the paper. And I think that in the context, was that, that, that was the time when every week another model came that said, well, for COVID, the solution might be, this is an actual paper, working for a week, then break, staying at home, then work, no, it was working for two weeks, then break, uh, then mm -hmm. staying at home. And this kind of very, um, original i would say ideas but before you make me do that in my before you disrupt my life like this i would like to see some evidence before you know we start implementing such major structural change right and and that was really the time when people were modeling all sorts of policy solutions so we thought there are so many ideas there was actually a paper that we cite in nature human behavior that proposed three ways in which you could modulate your social network so let's right. say only meeting uh, in a tighter circle or only, and, and you could test those. I mean, yes. of course you wouldn't be testing, uh, and this is another thing, you wouldn't be testing the, you would be testing the implementation, but I mean, already uh, we know from behavioral interventions, this <laughs> yes. is what matters, right? Yeah, you know, I, I just want to say a point there. I see so many people saying like, oh, this isn't a trial of masks. This is a trial of asking people to wear a mask. I was like, you know, that's exactly what we're doing. You, we're yeah. not doing, you know, the policy is asking people to do. We're not, we, we don't go to their house yeah. and strap it on and weld it to their face. So testing implementation is testing policy, which is the question. Yes. Yes, okay. We yes. agree. I mean, even you in drug trials, I mean, I don't know how, I mean, in psychotropic drug trials, you can't really, so there are some checks sometimes done to yes. see if people took their medication. But for instance, there is a big ethical debate now over a digital antipsychotic that to track whether you took it I or not. I saw that, that pill bottle that opens, yeah, you can track yeah. it, right? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it, it's not that we can <clears throat> put a camera, treatment, part of treatment is whether or not people, if people are not adherent to right. treatment, that's kind of an outcome. And in, in our uh, field where psychological interventions, for, for a lot of interventions, we know that people are not adherent, we know they're going to get to just do some sessions you know, and not, not come give back a good, and so on. I think the best example is like a diet. What if I said, you want to lose weight, you eat one carrot a day. And then, of course, after you tell people to eat one carrot a day, after two days, they, they, they stop eating one carrot, they eat normal food. And then you say, well, the problem was they didn't stick with one carrot a day. And it's like, well, that, that's part of your diet. No one can just yeah, eat one Yeah, that's part of your right? intervention. It's part of your exactly. intervention, yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. Yeah, it's not tolerable to eat one carrot. Otherwise, we wouldn't have any, you know, we would have the perfect diet, right? Now, okay. I think your paper is terrific, and I really liked, um, you know, people should read it, but I really like the part that, um, you know, you anticipate and respond to critics. And I think um, that was that was well done, <laughs> and, and and how like some people say it's the end of RCTs. COVID is the end of RCTs. It's yeah. the, you know, um, it's whoever gets the most likes is whatever the policy is going to be. Which I I feel like a lot of that was the case, um, but I hope that that is not the answer. Okay, the last topic I want to talk to you about. I'm sick of COVID, and this podcast we're gonna this, you're, this is you might be the last episode of season three because season four. It's called it's called post COVID. It's called zero COVID. Actually, it's zero, zero COVID because the podcast got zero COVID starting in season four. <laughs> zero. I have been able to do what only uh, these people dream about doing. I want zero COVID. <laughs> I'm gonna call. I'm gonna subtitle it zero COVID. Um, okay. My last question for you: reproducibility, replicability. What you know? Um, um, I guess I guess I'm curious. Like, what are you working on now in the space of meta research, non COVID? What's your what's your vision for meta research and reproducibility in the long term? You know, what what are the projects that you want to get back to? And 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 yeah, what are you working on? So I'm actually not working on a lot COVID related. Just to close me with too. COVID, I I had this piece, yeah, and then too. we have a, an an idea we're discussing with you that I want to reveal oh, here. Oh yes, but... I want to do that. That's one thing we have to do. That one thing. Just to prove yeah, one that's, point. That's yeah, one thing. One thing um, that needed to be done, but okay, then then we're done with it. Then we're done with it. Yeah. Then I mean, I'm I'm maybe years from now. I, but I, I obviously wasn't somebody who got involved in the technical aspects and 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 so on. So I mean, my interest is actually divided between two things: my day job, mm. where I have to do things that are um sort of relevant to clinical psychology, and then also applying for grants. I'm focusing on um, trying to um, separate psychological interventions into their components and use um, a technique called network meta-analysis to see which components work better. Oh, yes. So the, the driving principle is, yeah, is... Um, Explain to same. me, this, you know, we do it in oncology 
And, you know, people debated yeah. network meta-analysis. The premise is basically if A was compared to B and B was compared to C, you can learn something about A and C, even though they were never directly compared. Right. But the problem is, of course, the transitivity of B is the B in the A and B trial the same with the B in the B and C yes. trial. And there are statistical ways to look at this, but... But in, in behavioral interventions, we yes. have another problem because our A is actually a sum of a lot of things that might even potentiate each other or might diminish each other's uh, efficacy. So if you think treatment for depression, we do a lot of things. There are lots of components. And recently, network mental analysis has an extension where you can basically divide interventions into components and look at differences between components or combinations. Yes. Again, based on the idea that a lot of these things will be studied similarly in, in trials. I see. So, I mean, but I, I just to, the driving principle for me of all of this is I'm um, maybe a conservative in terms of reproducibility and mental research. I, I don't think we can afford to throw away what has been uh, conducted. And certainly we can't with clinical trials of psychological interventions because they take a long time and yes. a lot of resources and we can't get to this Numbers just think for more serious disorders like borderline personality treatment takes yes. a year. Okay, so a trial with treatment for a year, another follow up for a year. We can't just say, well, you know, there were problems. Let's throw this away. But so I'm more focused on trying to uh, um, squeeze the lemon as much as you can, you know, get as much as possible from research yes. already conduct individual patient data, um, try to look at the body of literature in a different yes. way and so on. At the same time, and this comes sort of a uh, so uh, hints to our future, hopefully, COVID project. I'm very interested in conflict of interest and in actually the um, heterogeneous ways in which conflict of interest can manifest itself. And actually, we wrote a, a viewpoint with John a couple of years ago about conflict of interest, about psychological intervention. Uh -huh. Because for a long while, people were just looking into some sort of intellectual allegiance to the intervention. You invented it. You were the first one to try it. You believe in it. You wrote the book. Whereas we argued there that there might be some real financial um, benefits that are being missed. And more now that a lot of digital behavior interventions are developing and an, an industry sort of got created yes. and it's not regulated like the pharma industry. Yes. I mean, there's no obligation to. So we basically in that viewpoint, we just summarize possible ways in which there might be something to disclose in relationship to psychological interventions. I so I'm very interested on that now and also looking at it more systematically across um, papers on digital interventions for depression, for instance, and then, yeah, this That's kind very, of uh, thing. That's very interesting. I guess um, I, I'll do the first point. The first point I think is interesting because I think you are – you're onto something. There are a number of fields where you have limited, fragmented, short duration, randomized studies. Um, and the question is, um, do we throw that away? Do we wring out what information we can? Um, does it vary by field? Actually, so that's interesting to me. I mean, in your field, I guess what I would say is that um, many of these things, there may not be doing, there may not be other ongoing efforts to look at it again. And so you have to ring. In my field, you know, some of the people who've done these very fragmented, flawed, limited studies, um, they have so much money and they're making billions from the product. So it's like you can afford to do a proper phase yeah. three. So there's a different pressure, but I think that's a good philosophical question. And then this conflict of interest, you know, um, I think it's so important. Um, I've been banging on about it for a long time, but you're right. Some people may own patents on certain types of depression scales or things like that. And certain types of forms that are administered, um, certain apps that's supposed to make you feel better. Um, right. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and we shall not say what we may someday do uh, working on. Uh, uh, but, you know, you, you said something that actually resonated with me, which was um, you don't do a lot of COVID research. I don't do a lot of COVID research too. I think probably, you know, we're probably going to publish, I don't know, conservatively, maybe 30 papers this year, 30 to 40 papers. And I think uh, maybe one will have anything with, ah, close my door. Uh, one will have anything with like COVID in the title um, and uh, the rest won't. Um, and so uh, uh, good. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. I was an intentional choice because, you know, there were, there only, I don't know. Let me, let me ask you this question. Last question for you. Um, Cause I know I've taken so much of your time. Um, what percent of research on COVID-19 is true and useful? 
Yeah, I don't know. That's not a question for me. <laughs> there were Twitter polls on it too. I, I don't know. I mean, I would go for 10%, but I'm probably being very, very generous. So, yeah. and I mean, you could rephrase this actually and say what percent of the meta research on COVID is actually true and useful. And I think it would be even even lower. But yeah, I, I mean, we don't, and if you look at these big projects like the Living Natural Meta Analysis yeah. Initiatives and this project that collated all the clinical trials that are being proposed yeah. and you don't know what happens to them, probably some stopped recruiting or yes. couldn't even start, but it yes. just gives you an idea of the, um, the waste. Uh, weight of the researcher. Now, I, I did a recent um, very rough search on PubMed using the COVID, their COVID-19 yeah. filter, and there are roughly 130,000 articles. That's what I saw, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so... Uh, it's, it's a lot. You know, so I, I said something I, like... I don't know. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, over the last month, I've gotten more peer review requests than I've ever gotten in my life. You know, maybe not, not last month, last six months, I've gotten like, I mean, how many peer review requests? I can't peer review all these. Articles. I mean, it's hun- I mean, I, I don't, I, I maybe even a hundred peer review requests since COVID started. Unbelievable. Um, and you know, and and then I think we have the, I suspect we have the greatest glut of papers. We have all the COVID papers in submission, and all the papers people were doing because they have more time because they're not going to conference and they're not doing yeah. this and that, and and it's just glut. And then somebody was somebody was saying that like, oh, well, that's because people are trying to help. I was like, they're trying to help. These COVID papers ain't helping. I mean, very few of them may be helping somebody. Most of them are helping yourself to a citation, but they're not helping anybody. They're very poor quality. Yeah. I think um, the worst, I mean, I guess some of them are great recovery and some of these analyses about drug products will be helpful. But I worry about some of these randomized trials of drugs that the randomized trial is not going to yield a result until all of the wealthy nations have vaccinated everybody. Um, And then ironically, the drug that they're assessing cannot be afforded by the nation that does not yet have the vaccine. And so it's like a catch-22. You you answered a question for wealthy nations and they've already vaccinated everybody. So it's a moot point. Um, Anyway, but... um, Joanna Christia, thank you so much for doing thank this. Thank you. We covered a lot of ground. Um, I always enjoy. I always enjoy our discussions. You always make me laugh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we can't. We, we dare not tell tell everything we talk about. But um, I yeah. think you know we hit on some of the major themes that I wanted to cover with you. I wanted to cover the theme of, you know, what does what do you learn from experience doing research. You know, what is, uh, what, you know, that, what are your scientific contributions? Oh, it was a rhetorical question. No need to answer. I've already Googled and there are, you have none. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, the, the balance between supporting an ECR and indulging, indulging unnecessary um, anguish. Um, I think that's anguish, a balancing yeah. act, you know, indulging somebody who, uh, when they don't need to be indulged and they need to be developing thicker skin. And how that carries yeah, forward. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to say here that yeah. we, clearly we're not talking about real problems. We're not talking about diminishing somebody's uh, genuine struggles. We're talking about this rapport you have with your submissions and with yes. your academic productivity. So we're not talking about minimizing anyone's, you know, you have a hard situation at home or yeah. you are in a tough uh, health situation or a tough relationship yeah, or whatever. Those are whatever. real problems, so, yeah. Yeah, we're yeah. talking about the the struggles that are inherent to academia, which is rejection. Yeah, exactly. You're in the rejection I, you're in and... the rejection business with the occasional acceptance. You know, that's the business. And also, yeah. I think somebody saying something a little harder to you than you want them to say it. I think you, if you don't if you don't get over that, you're not going to be able to. I I really think you know. I mean, you're not going to be able to do what you need to do in this life. How many? I, I I'm going to go on my little rant. I'm going to give you the last word. I was I was give the, the last word, but I just want to go on my little rant, which is. People need to ask themselves, what is the goal of your career? Is the goal of your career to keep your mouth shut on everything you think matters and only talk about whatever stupid esoteric topic that you think will further your career? If that's your goal, I don't know what you're doing this for. Quit right now. Go into private practice. Go into do something else. There's a lot more money out there. There are a lot better ways to be very comfortable. You don't need to use the academy for this. Yeah. If you're in the academy, you got to put your chip down on issues that actually matter, like schools, like, you know, you don't, I mean, not every issue has to be your issue, but some issues have to be your issue drugs and development and cost and healthcare and 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 evidence has to be your issue and if you make that your issue and put your chip down someone's going to come and kick you and they're going to kick you and kick you and kick you and you got to take at least a few kicks and if you can't take a rejection in private when no one sees it you're not going to take the kicks that you need to take to keep persisting on those issues because yeah. nobody did anything if they're scared to take a kick okay anyway that, that, all right, did we talked about that and then and then the last thing we talked about covid research um your research um I'll give you the last word. 
uh, on any of these topics. Um, and uh, and I hope uh, you, you keep sharing with me your wisdom because I really enjoy reading it. Uh, it makes me chuckle. Um, so thank you so much. <laughs> um, yeah, and, uh, and you, you can talk about any of these topics you wish to, to, to round us out. Okay, so to round this out, I think the one point I want to make is that one thing that COVID showed and COVID research showed is that, as somebody else said, it, I think Stefan Barral said, because before me, we have the, the, the science and we have our values and the decisions that we make are very much infused of our values. So what I wish, maybe also from my point of view as a meta researcher, as a conflict of interest meta researcher, I would like people to make these kind of values and financially not financial not values, but clear where are you, uh, what are you worried about and what are you gaining for? And then give me your scientific opinion. It's not that I will disregard it, but I will know that in the end, perhaps we are discussing mm, for a lot of policy decisions, just whether I value this more or whether I value this more. And when the discussion is in these terms, instead of science versus anti-science, I guess, I, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's more fair and um, more, uh, some, some, some progress can, can be made in that direction. So yeah, that's, it's this issue of, 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 of values that are behind even the science we are promoting, I think here is, is fundamental with COVID. Joanna Christia, thank you so much. Thank you.